Right. Okay, welcome along everyone. Um, just to start, I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Ed Sayer. I'm an educational psychologist and I work for Southampton City Council as part of their EP team, which is called Southampton Psychology Service. Um, I'm also linked with the mental health in schools team and count in that direction, uh, where I've been a clinical lead uh, across uh, the, the pre-pandemic year. Um, I've been asked to come and talk to you guys about school refusal today. And I have uh, kind of reframed that as emotionally based school avoidance. And I'll, I'll come on to tell you uh, more about why uh, I've chosen that term and why um, our service uh, is using EBSA as a model rather than thinking of it uh, solely as school refusal. But before we dive into that, uh, I know um, some of you are watching from home um, today and some of you are going to be watching on recording. So hi to all of you. Um, I am also at home, as you can see, this is my blurred kitchen background. Uh, my wife is also working from home. She's work working elsewhere in the house. Uh, my dog, Daisy, is also asleep somewhere. Um, we might get an interruption from Daisy uh, if she needs a drink uh, or if the, uh, the postie comes. Those are the two times we might hear Daisy. Uh, so apologies if uh, any of that uh, interrupts us at all. In terms of our etiquette for today as a webinar, a lot of this will be me talking at camera. I'm going to hopefully have some times where we can pause and we can think uh, to ourselves. I'm not going to invite anyone to have a, a group discussion uh, during the, the input today, um, but I will try and provide some time for questions and answers and discussions at the end. Uh, please be aware, though, that if you've got your cameras on, you will be being recorded. And as Jill highlighted before we started recording, this is being hosted on uh, a YouTube channel. So um, if you are making comments or, um, or uh, appearing by camera, you'll be part of that recording, um, which is great if you're happy with that. Um, at alternative times, if you want to ask any questions as we go, um, please pop them in the chat or make any comments. As far as uh, myself and Jill can, we will uh, pick those up as we go. Um, uh, and if they fit, we'll, we'll bring them in. If they need to be held towards the end, we'll, we'll do a review towards the end of any uh, comments that are in there. Um, also, it is really helpful if we can stay muted um, so that the computer doesn't uh, lose the audio. It, it kind of competes across um, if there's uh, more than one uh, audio input. Um, it's, it's difficult, but hopefully we won't have too many technical problems and all will go well. Fingers crossed. Um, wonderful. So, first technical issue, mouse not working. There we go. Uh, it's important to set my stall out early. As an educational psychologist, uh, I strongly believe that um, the, the positivity is a, a massive power that we need to um, hold on to and, and think forwards with and that change is always possible in any situation. So as, as an EP, I often focus on what we can change and what we can do to help unpick a situation to solve a problem rather than um, solely defining what the problem is and uh, kind of thinking it in, a, in that deficit model of what's wrong. It's more uh, for me a focus of, okay, how can we make it right? What can we do to, to bring around that positive change? So when we're talking about this, this world of um, school refusal, um, uh, extended absence and emotional based uh, school absence, it can feel like we get stuck in a, um, an unchangeable situation, a vicious cycle where there doesn't feel like there is a way out. And part of our conversation today is, is helping us see that there can be that change, that we aren't alone in doing that, that, that it's not just down to the young person, not just down to the family, but a, a team around uh, that situation. And that even if it might not feel possible, we can make that change happen and we can make things better. And throughout the session today, I'm looking to cover these areas. 
the main part of, of uh, my talk is going to cover the blue areas. We're going to uh, revisit what we understand about anxiety, what that is and, and how that's experienced, link that into uh, emotionally based school absence, define that term further um, uh, and kind of explore how EBSA can develop and what, what factors are involved with that. Then importantly, think together about how we might support a young person uh, experiencing EBSA. And then time allowing, I'd like to spend some time talking about uh, the important um, additional step of thinking of us as um, core parts of this process and how we take care of ourselves and build resilience for ourselves when we are supporting others. I think that's really important to remember that although a young person might be experiencing EBSA, so are the people caring for them. It's not just the young person, it's not just a decision and you know, all down to them. We're the ones trying to support. We're the ones dealing with the fallout. So it's really, really important that we recognize and consider the impact on us and how we um, kind of look after ourselves with that. Okay, so that's gonna be the last, um, last section of today. Um, but knowing that I can talk, I'm, I put them in yellow in case I don't quite come on to them. If I don't, I'll do a, a separate record for you um, uh, so that, that we can make sure that there's something uh, on that subject. Okay. So what is anxiety? Being extremely conscious that I'm talking to a, 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 a group of parents who have had significant contact with um, our mental health services, I'm trying not to uh, kind of teach you stuff you already know in any way, um, but I want us to make sure that we're on the same page to start with. So when we're talking about anxiety, we often talk about worry or um, tension and stress. And in its most basic terms, anxiety is that uncomfortable experience. And it, it's kind of characterized by changes in um, our emotions, that unease, that distress, in our thoughts, so or, or our cognitions. So, for example, the, the fears and the things that we worry about, um, the helplessness, the, the feeling like we don't have a direction that we can go in. And, of course, in our physiology, in our bodies. So it can be in that muscle tension, feeling tight, feeling it in your shoulders, um, feel your heart racing feeling sick. So we see that this, this term, anxiety, has an impact on multiple parts of our bodies. And of course, with that, there's an impact on how we behave, how we act. We might need to get out of situations, escape. We might um, feel like we can't do anything and we freeze. Or we might um, find that we're responding in an um, impulsive way that can sometimes be aggressive, whether that's verbal or physical, in order to survive the threat, the worry, the unease that we're experiencing. And sometimes we might act in a way that avoids that altogether. We can see it coming, but we, instead of putting ourselves through that, we avoid it entirely. The key point here is that experiencing some level of anxiety or worry is not in itself unusual. That's a, a human experience. We can all have worries and anxieties that rise and fall at different times. And usually we have the capacity, the skill base, the resilience to be able to deal with them. But it's when the level of stress or the frequency of stress and anxiety that we feel outweighs the skills and structures and capacity we have to cope with it, that that anxiety can have a uh, negative impact on our day-to-day uh, -day lives and, and really, really become uh, more of a significant level. So why might we become overwhelmed by things? Let, let's start by thinking about our brains and how our brains work. Our brains have spent millions of years 
evolving. They've spent all the time that humans have existed to become the, the versions they are now. But in that time, for a big chunk of it, they were developed in order to um, cope with a specific threat, to, come, to be able to uh, respond to something immediate. So if you think about it, our emotions were, were there to help us know that there was a reason for us not to feel safe anymore. So a lion appears, we feel stressed, we run away, stress gone. A storm rumbles in the distance. We start to worry about it and think about finding shelter. You find the shelter, anxiety goes down. You're feeling thirsty, you're feeling that sickness because you, you haven't eaten or drunk today. If you're stressed, dehydrated, it tells you you need this to survive. You do that, that stress comes down. So we can see that those anxieties and stresses are there for a reason to help us survive. We can see it in our social actions too. I'm worried or scared by a situation. Being on my own, I don't feel safe, but being close to others helps me. I feel more comfortable. I feel safe. Um, and, and you help me survive. You're my shelter. You're my community in that. For those of you that have been watching too many crime thrillers, that works the other way too. So I don't feel safe next to you. You're making me feel quite worried. I'm getting out of it. So we can see that these, these emotions, these responses, the way in which our brain perceives and reacts to situations has been well drilled over, uh, over these thousands and thousands of years that, that humans have existed in order to help us um, find sustenance and safety. But modern life's not quite like that. The pace of change has increased so rapidly uh, since prehistoric times. In the last 100 years, we've seen the rise of the car, the airplane, television, the computer, uh, what I often call weapons of mass destruction. You've got um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all of that stuff right in your hand all the time. So we have lots more stimuli and the type of threats that we face are very different. The frequency with which we might go hungry, we might be scared by a wild animal, they're very different, but our brains are still wired in the same way to respond. Okay, so the type of anxiety we experience today follows the same pattern, but may not be quite as, um, uh, the, the method doesn't always fix the problem. To help us with that, I want to show us a short video uh, by a guy called uh, Dan Siegel. Okay, and um, I'm going to click on this in a second, and hopefully the sound should all come through. Jill, I'm going to look to you to make sure you're nodding that you can hear things. Now, Dan Siegel's a, a psychologist who, who developed this idea of the hand model of the brain, which, which I use quite frequently, and I, I think it really helps us um, explain to young people and to others just what might be happening when we're feeling stressed and overwhelmed and, uh, and the, the kind of uh, chemical processes in the brain. So hopefully when I click down here, you should be able to hear him loud and clear. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up representing the wrist and then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas. And the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, 
is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain it to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. So before Dan starts talking again, and on a repeat video, I just changed the slide there, but I just want to hold for a second to, to emphasize the, the ease with which that hand model can be used. The idea of um, noticing that, that we're flipping our lids, but that our lids can be put back on, that, that whole idea that, that remembering that the lid part, that's the bit that, that handles language, handles good rational thinking. But if we flipped our lids, we know we're not going to be thinking rationally. We might need to take some time to calm before we then enter into those kind of more rational uh, uh, kind of repair type situations. This links in with emotional regulation and, and, and those needs as well. When we're thinking about uh, if you link it in with, uh, for example, attachment theory, when we're talking about co-regulation, how we help somebody else recognize their emotions are, are rising let them know that they're not alone in dealing with that, recognize that sometimes we need space, sometimes we need closeness and connection. Doing all that emotional literacy work of, of labeling uh, the, these terms and helping people have words for uh, their, their feelings. So that whole process, that, that, that whole notion of uh, the handle of the brain, I find very, very helpful in communicating with young people um, and for them to communicate with me about their stress levels. Okay, there are other videos online that could be really useful. There's a guy called Russ Harris um, who um, works in this area called acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, a lot of his work is around trauma-based work too. So some of those uh, videos that are more cartoon-based that are um, uh, thinking about the, the, the brain's reaction to stress over time, keeping high levels of stress, worth a, worth a look. Okay, so building on, from uh, Dan's work there on, on the, the, the hand model and what, what might happen. It's important to recognize that we all need stress and anxiety and worry. It's not that we just feel it, it, it helps us get energized and ready to, um, uh, ready to be able to react to things. So this uh, chart, it, it's often called the inverted U uh, shape for, for stress or for anxiety. And as you can see, if we've got too little stress and anxiety, too little um, uh, kind of alertness, then our performance isn't at its peak. It's subpar. So if you think about it, when you wake up in the morning, when you're just uh, crawling out of bed and, and you know, you've got three or four problems to solve already, it might be for you that you need a cup of coffee before you get going. Well, that's about just raising that alertness and, and getting yourself reacting, okay? Um, and that can um, rise to an ideal level. But it's when we tip over that ideal level, where our stress or anxiety becomes too much for us, that our performance starts to dip again. Let's think of that through um, the medium of a, a sports person. Say a footballer, uh, you've got to be able to react quickly to the things that are changing around you. You've got to be responding, responding, responding. So you've got to have that that stress, that positive anxiety up. 
But if you get overwhelmed by that emotion, that's when you lose it. That's when you see red. That's when you, you make a rash challenge or um, you, you get sent off because you, you've completely and utterly uh, kind of gone the other way. Your performance has gone right down. You can't concentrate anymore. A recent example of that anxiety going too high, too high and, and getting into a place where you're no longer in rational control of your behavior, but you're uh, behaving in an emotionally driven way. Will Smith at the Oscars. Yeah, something had pushed him right up there. And those actions, he's going to have consequences for those for quite a while. But it was clear that that wasn't a choice. He was being led by his emotions and his behaviours. From a psychologist's point of view, I was watching on going, ooh, someone help him. Okay, so the inverted U helps us know that some stress and anxiety can be positive, but it's when it becomes too much that it can um, uh, impact on our ability to cope with, uh, with everyday lives. And with that, here is a kind of simplified chart of the type of things we might worry about or be anxious about or be fearful of in childhood. Now, it's important to say that, that this is almost like a developmental chart. So at different points, if you've had positive co-regulation, if you haven't got additional stresses and, and strains in your life, Joe Bloggs will have been able to be, be worried about this at one phase in their childhood, but now be resilient against it. So, for example, take two to four years, imaginary creatures being scared of the dark and um, being worried about people getting into your house. Now, as your cognition and, and your um, cognitive skills develop, you get to be uh, at a level where you know what the safety things are in. The front door is shut. It's locked. Um, animals in themselves aren't scary because I've had better experiences with them. Um, the dark, there isn't something scary in the dark. It's just, I'll turn the light on. We have those coping strategies, so we develop those through. Now, it is important to say that these um, broad age ranges are blurry. Okay, so for example, my eight-year-old son uh, remains quite worried about the dark. Okay, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Doesn't mean that he's developmentally behind. There is a reason. I did jump out on him once and made a, um, a, a parenting faux pas. Um, and uh, that has had a, a knock-on effect that he likes to sleep with the light on. Uh, yes, epic fail, uh, dad duties here. Um, but if that impacted on every dark situation, so for example, going out the house in the evening with us, if, the, the, if it was dark, if that was impacting massively, then that would be a significant anxiety. Um, it, it's not in that situation. But as I say, here are some rough ideas. But also when we think about this from adolescent onwards, we also have modern elements to add in. So uh, young people are more aware of climate change, um, of uh, access to world events. So everything that's happened in Ukraine, recently and the impact that that might well have had and, and thinking about our city's uh, uh, makeup the number of young people who have uh, journeyed here from uh, uh, in, in seeking asylum um, bringing their previous trauma and stresses with them these are major things that, that don't fit into a nice neat table like this so as much as these are here as a simplified version we must remember that it's an individual experience so our own um, life journeys and our um, balance of resilience versus stress at a particular time can impact on what we might be fearful of and um, how we might experience that. When we think about our bodily response to these situations, it's important to, to, to notice that there is that psychosomatic connection. The, the fears and, and, and worries originate in our brains, but we feel the experience of our brains throughout our bodies. Uh, in this uh, diagram, you've got some uh, possible uh, reactions that we might have um, to 
those heightened emotions, whether it's our mind racing or going blank, whether we feel dizziness, whether we might sweat or shiver or tremble, whether we get that uncomfortable feeling in our stomachs. And that's often a, a great example of um, how very young children, so infant junior children might indicate that they're worried about something. I feel sick, I've got a headache, my arm aches, something that is physical because they don't have those emotional literacy skills. They don't have yet those words that help them tell us what emotions are, are going on for them. And again, remember that hand model, even if we ask them, well, tell me what's going on for you. If they're in a, a, a very stressed lid flipped position, they may not have the words and awareness to be able to tell us. And even if they're calm, they still may not have the words or, or, or awareness. There's that whole question for, you know, when, when a child doesn't, like, why did you do that? Oh, I don't know. I was just trying to deal with the situation. Um, it's our job to join with them as, as kind of detectives to help them work out what emotions they may be feeling, what might be contributing to that. And then also to, to help um, them think about how we can deal with them. Okay, so modeling and um, practicing those, those kind of better coping strategies with them, which we'll come back to. So as um, we should remember with that, that hand model and with that inverted U thing uh, graph as well, when we are stressed, and that amygdala bit, the, the kind of alarm system is operating and is, is going off. It's really hard for us to use that rational thinking brain. That means that small things that aren't threatening may be perceived as big threatening things. So we are in that um, survival mode, that fight, flight, freeze. So we, all, we, we, we often hear about those three, don't we? Fight, flight, freeze. But there's also a couple of others there. There's fawn, which means acting much younger than you are, making yourself very kind of uh, uh, baby-like or child-like. Um, and there's another one that's escaping me at the moment, but there's five. So there's fight, flight, freeze, fawn, flop. So it's completely stop. So instead of just freeze in the moment, it's almost like disengage from the world and, and flop. Can't get out of bed can't get up off the sofa, can't even respond verbally. So we've got those, those different ways in which we may um, try to cope with these feelings that are underneath it. So what's happening cognitively for us at these times? Well, often we, uh, we find that if we are overly anxious or overly stressed, where that um, uh, prefrontal cortex, the, 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 the logical part of our brain, isn't working as well as it is or is completely offline, we don't think positively. We, we, we um, reduce down the number of ways in which we see a situation and we tend to look for things that confirm what we're already feeling. And that can uh, result in quite a negative cycle. And we get these, what, what are called ants, automatic negative thoughts. And uh, there's some examples here on the screen from catastrophizing, making, uh, thinking the absolute worst in a situation, um, to uh, personalization, where we are the main part of our story. So we assume we're the main part of everybody else's story and everything's targeted against us. The world is against us. Um, to this all or nothing thinking, it's either this or it's that. And you kind of simplify it to that point. We miss out all those gray areas, all those uh, empathy and, uh, and consideration of alternative perspectives. Um, and with that, it, it can be, can be very, very easy to get stuck in this downward spiral, this negativity, because we're looking for that information that doesn't challenge us, but reinforces the, the correctness of our, of our own view already. So um, this is one of the places where we want to recognize that it's a, a place we can challenge, but also be really careful 
if we come in too hard with a challenge to somebody's automatic negative thoughts, we've got to think about this. There's, there's a notion in psychology called cognitive dissonance. And what that means is um, the distance or dissonance difference between one person's perspective and another's. So, for example, um, if Jill felt a certain way about the world and, and viewed it a certain way, um, and I came in and told her that she was plain wrong and my view was the right one. There's a big cognitive dissonance between us, between our viewpoints. So Jill has two options. She either completely discounts her own view and uh, completely agrees with me. So she's got to take this whole massive jump to my way of viewing the world. Or more likely, because we are uh, built to kind of believe ourselves a little bit more, self-serving bias, this is called. Um, she's going to go, Ed's completely wrong. I'm going to disregard his view and stick to mine. Okay. For our, if our cognitive dissonance gap is too big, that's what we end up with. Uh, take approaches like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. What, what we do in some of those is we test out the, the viewpoint that you've got, and then we, we help provide a little bit of evidence that might just suggest one point of change. So we reduce down, we, we, we still think that there might be two different points, but we reduce down the di distance or the challenge so that we move somebody along one little step. So the dissonance isn't. So uh, for example, all or nothing, it has to be perfect or uh, everything else is, uh, is just failing. Okay, well, hang on. In this test, you got 25. So you didn't get everything wrong. You got 25 right. That's brilliant. Well done. Let's see if we can get 26 right. Okay, so the difference between... Um, all wrong versus some right. So we're, we're starting to, to just change that gap slightly. I got the question wrong. I'm so stupid. Well, hang on, how many other people got it wrong? Okay, did you, now you've got it wrong once. Do you think you'll be able to remember how to get it right next time? That was a really difficult question, but actually I wouldn't expect you to get right. I set that as a challenge. You know, so we've got all those different ways in which we can start to change the way in which that situation is being interpreted without changing it from this point here to this point here straight away. OK, so let's think about this in relation to somebody going to school. How would we know if somebody is anxious about school? What kind of thoughts might they show? What kind of uh, negative appraisals or, or, or judgments of a situation might they have? How and what physical reactions might we see and, and what type of avoidance behaviours? So, for example, the thoughts, everyone will be uh, thinking I'm stupid. I don't know what I'm doing in lesson. Um, I can't go to the toilet. Um, uh, I'll be sick if I eat in the cafeteria. So all of these kind of things about either a performance or a social judgment or some level of uh, embarrassment in front of others, but at a very extreme level. The negative appraisal, going to school is scary because the idea of, you know, there's lots of people, it's noisy environment. Um, I don't know where I'm going. It's scary because everybody else knows where they're going and I don't. All of these kind of things where we're, we're already in that negative. The physical reactions. I've got a tummy ache this morning. My clothes don't feel comfortable. They're all too tight. Um, I, I, I can't eat breakfast. I feel too sick. All of those elements are starting to hint towards us. I can't sleep. All of those things are hinting towards us that there might be something about school that is worrying a young person. The avoidance behaviours. These ones um, uh, are, are quite... Right. I always try not to use the word devious with children because that has such a negative uh, connotation. It's the idea that they're trying to be a problem. And I've got a slide coming up um, uh, in, in a few moments. It's going to say challenge that idea of children being problems. 
We've got to always think about any behavior of solving a problem. So the avoidance behaviors um, is that not getting to the school if you're walking independently? Is that not getting dressed? I've lost my shoes. Um, I can't possibly brush my teeth. You know, the toothpaste has run out. All of these things that might be small individual things, but become a block to the getting ready for school. Getting out of bed in the first place, setting the alarm, staying up late the night before in order to be tired the next morning. All of these things, um, do something to help us avoid a situation that's going to make us feel unsafe or insecure. It's, it's illogical problem solving. Similar to that, if I don't step on the cracks, then I won't break my mother's back. You know, that, that our whole idea of if I just do this, then that won't happen. So I want you to, to think of your own context just for a moment. Um, uh, this might be something you come back to after the session, but just take a moment to, to think with your own family setup. So the young people you care for, but also for yourself. How do you recognize that anxious feeling? What are the thoughts or feelings or actions that, um, that you notice? Can you relate to those Ants, those automatic negative thoughts. Do you spot those in yourself and in others? So after today, a good opportunity to just think about that for a second from an anxiety point of view. So some of those thoughts might well be along the, the lines of, I can't cope with this. What if this happens? I won't feel safe. I know it's going to go wrong. All of those type uh, um, feelings. Maybe we see people uh, with all those body sensations that we've been talking about as well. It's really important to recognize that if we just treat or respond to the body sensations or the actions, the behaviors, that we miss the anxiety in the center. We miss the reason. There's a, um, a psychologist called um, Gary Lavigne, who says, uh, there's two, two elements that he says. One, one is that um, we don't hear the whispers of behavior, we get the shouts. So if, if we don't see the small things and respond and think about what that behavior is about, we get the up, up the ante, you know, we get the bigger ones. And I tend to, to think about it a bit like um, if you're doing wallpapering or if you're doing, um, if, if you're ages with me or remember doing your sticky back plastic on your, your school books, if there's a bubble, if you ignore the bubble or you just try and squish the bubble, it moves around. You've got to go back to why there's a bubble there. There's some air caught. Same here, if we just squish the actions or we squish the body sensations, come on, it's all right, you're fine. Um, no, you don't act this way, you act that way. If we don't go back to the bubble, which is the anxiety, and address that, it's just gonna pop up somewhere else. Uh, just a little note to say, um, Elsa support. You see this slide is taken from, or this picture is taken from Elsa support. Elsa stands for Emotional Literacy Support Assistance. Um, they originated in Southampton and are, uh, uh, kind of at least nationwide, if not worldwide now. Um, they are great people in school to, to support you with some of this area. And Elsa support as a, as a uh, Facebook group and as a, um, a web page are, are great for resources. So just to, to nod to that. Okay. So how might we, um, how might we stamp out some of those automatic thoughts. And it goes back to that question or the, those comments I made a little bit earlier. We're curious, being carefully curious with somebody rather than being too directed can help um, minimize or reduce that cognitive dissonance and help broaden their view on a situation. Gently doesn't. So um, we want to move from that automatic stream of thoughts about events, negative appraisals, 
to a, a more conscious and curious consideration of what the situation um, uh, fully says. So I wonder whether, what makes you think that this is a frightening thing? Has that ever happened to you? How likely is it that it could? Um, do you think other people view things this way? Those kind of questions can help guide somebody to consider the validity of their current con uh, construction, the, the way in which they see things. Obviously, we'd adjust that for different ages and we'd consider when we'd ask those questions. Um, there's a guy called Bruce Perry, who's a, a, a psychologist who, who uh, talks about um, neurosequential sequencing. And uh, you often see this with a, a, a triangle and the three R's. And, and he says that, um, that, that it's important not to try and rationalize with somebody straight away. If they're, if they're in a heightened emotional state, the first jo job we, we have is to uh, relate to them, uh, to, to regulate, relate, and then rationalize. So we help co-regulate first, so the calming activities. Then we relate, we normalize, we, we ensure that they don't feel alone, and then we rationalize, then we do this type of conversation. Okay. So let's Ed, sorry, Ed, can I ask, would you use the same sort of approach with somebody with autism? Obviously, a lot of our children within the group have autism, and I just wondered how that would impact on trying to get them to change their way of thinking. Uh, great question, Jill. And um, what we find with uh, those on an autistic spectrum condition is uh, uh, those experiencing that might things in a very black and white uh, way. And that, that's not no problem in itself. But we might find that the uh, reliance on language and conversation may not be as helpful. So we might want to bring in some um, visuals to help us. One great way in which I would um, uh, utilize in here, I would use something called comic strip conversations. Uh, okay, so in comic strip conversations, which is developed by a woman called Carol Gray, there's lots of information on the um, National Autistic Society website on, on that too. What's good about comic strip conversations is it gives you a kind of utilize stick people but you're also bringing out the, the kind of thoughts, the feelings and the words being used in a situation. So it gives you a uh, indirect point. that You can then think with somebody about um, why might somebody feel this way? They might have said this, but what happens if they were thinking this? So you, there's a color coding system to that, but it makes the uh, kind of potentially hidden and complicated uh, social communication element of things much more plain. Okay, and I'd still use the curious questions, but I might um, move away from a direct conversation about your feelings and your, your thoughts. I would start somewhere independent. Ryan over here, who's uh, somebody we made up, was in this situation, someone responded. Can you help me pick why he might have responded this way? Those kind of ways. How, yeah. Is that okay, Jill? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great, thank you. So um, here was a prompt for us to think back to our own uh, situation. If we we're in, in person, I'd get us to discuss um, uh, that in, in more detail. However, I cannot cope with the technology of trying to send you into breakout rooms, especially if you're watching this on a recording. So we'll, we'll jump forward and think a bit more directly about emotionally-based school absence. Okay. So we've done quite a big, big chunk on thinking about stress and anxiety and our bodily responses to that and what's going on with our brain. And we've started linking it with our experiences of school. Um, in this section, we'll think a bit more about what might be causing that and, and how we can work to, to help address that and, and reduce down any um, anxiety and, and then try and improve um, school attendance not just school attendance, but engagement and positive experience in school for young people too. So writing 40 years ago, we would have been talking about school phobia, the idea of somebody being phobic of school, scared of school. That very much places the problem within the child, 
within the young person it says it's you that's broken you need to be fixed okay so the idea of that would have been can't attend feeling upset staying at home with parental knowledge that that kind of was the definition of what school phobia was more recently we hear about school refusal or uh, a school avoidance but both of those terms still place almost like a choice on a young person as if it, it, it's as simple as i don't want to but we know that the emotional health of young people the complexities of growing brains are, are much more uh, detailed than a simple choice the choice might be what we're seeing on the surface but it's definitely not what's going on underneath and this is where the idea of ebsa emotionally based so there's an emotional reason for for it school absence it's not avoidance it's not refusal it's they're not there but that also gives a space for yet so there comes my idea on positive change it's absence at the moment but absence can change so um, we're trying to move that problem from solely within the young person to an interaction between what's going on for them, the school environment and the support structures around. If we place a problem outside of a young person, outside of an individual and in the interaction, then we can feel more empowered to do something about it. We don't just have to wait for them to be able to develop the skills or or um, capacity to cope, it's we can make a change too. And I think that's important because uh, with these type of situations, often it's those around a young person that are feeling disempowered, that have tried and tried and tried, but feel like nothing they do makes a difference. But redirecting that and thinking about the, those external factors can help us feel re-empowered to be able to help them. And that, that's ultimately what we want to do. Okay, so when we're thinking about uh, um, EBSA, it's not one thing is EBSA and one thing isn't. It, there's a, a kind of uh, a range of different forms of EBSA that, that can be there. Um, this research has highlighted that it can be that somebody's got a full attendance, but they're disengaged from lessons or they can be in school, but not in class. You might have the odd day off, um, the occasional absence, or periods of absence. So for example, uh, Fridays to Tuesdays, or um, several weeks at a time, but then coming back. Or that persistent absence, the, the not engaged in education at all. But the most common and striking feature of EBSA is the emotion, emotional distress that young people are experiencing. So whether you're in school, but not being able to access, access lessons because you're too stressed, or whether you're too stressed and avoiding school entirely and being persistent absence, that emotional distress is the, the, the kind of common thread. And we're not saying that, you know, um, one person will show the same um, type of EBSA over time. It, we might have peaks and troughs. It might be that we are able to maintain good attendance for a period of time and then have sporadic absence. You know, we have ups and downs, uh, like in other walks of uh, other areas of our life, that's, that stresses come and they, they rise and they fall. Um, so let's now think together a little bit more about why um, EBSA develops. This is the quote I was uh, referencing earlier by a psychologist called Martin Herbert. And the, the kind of paraphrasing of this is that kids aren't trying to create more of a challenge, they're trying to solve the challenges they're experiencing. Okay, but, but they can only see the world through their own eyes and their own experiences. And they can only approach those problems with the skills they've got. 
as adults, we've had so much more experience, opportunities to learn. And often we have so much more emotional regulation skills to be able to, uh, instead of shrink down the view to the situation, broaden it out, take that emotional step back to solve problems. But kids are often trying to solve problems rather than trying to be them. This has again got that positive psychology slant on it, the idea that, well, if they're seeing the world through the, the eyes that they've got, well, let, let's help them see the world more broadly. Let's give them more knowledge. Let's give them more skills to approach these situations. So rather than see it as a choice, I don't want to go to school, therefore I'm not. Um, I don't like learning, therefore I'm going to disengage from it. We need to give it as a, uh, be the detectives to think about what they're communicating through that. What, why don't they like school? What is it that's causing them stress and anxiety? Is it that they're struggling with their learning? Is it that there's a social element going on? Is it that there's some uh, a physical sensory type difficulty that we need to unpick with them in order to find a better solution than the one that they're using? Because the solution that they're using is working because it's making them feel safer, but it's not working in the long term. It's a faulted solution. Okay. So here are a few things, uh, kind of considerations for us trying to think. What are they, uh, what does this behavior communicate to us about um, the feelings? What are they trying to solve? What are they trying, what do they need that's missing that would enable them to cope? Or better than cope, to flourish and thrive? What does not attending? or not engaging, achieve for them? Okay, what's the reward that helps reinforce that behavior rather than um, make them feel motivated to do the thing that they find more challenging? So Kearney's work in 2009 highlighted four main functions of um, behaviors that were related to emotionally based school apps. So we've got these uh, avoidant ones to avoid school-based stresses. So things that related to the school environment in itself. To avoid social situations or activities. So things that in a social nature were, were causing a challenge. And then on the other side, to gain things. So either to gain or seek attention that they needed and this is a, a, an important rephrase again for, um, from us as psychologists, rather than attention seeking, it's attention needing often for young people. How, uh, why, do they, why does their attention need not yet feel full? How can we help that feel full enough so that they can step away into a different action? And then to engage in preferred activities. Now that might really feel like a choice, but again, let's think of this from a human perspective we'd all rather be doing certain things. And as adults, we can make choices, rational choices about why we do spend our time doing some things and why we spend our time doing things that we'd rather not. So for example, some people choose a, a job that they love, other people work because they need to gain the, the, the thing that comes at the end of the work, which is often the money in order to live, okay? so. There's that delayed gratification part in there that as adults we're a lot better at than, than young people too. Now, these are also color coded for a reason. Um, all of these things reinforce the behavior. So they reinforce a way of seeing a situation and a coping strategy to manage it. The orange ones are positive reinforcers. This means that uh, we experience something pleasant from these actions, okay? The green ones are what are uh, called negative reinforcers. They relieve us from a situation that was uncomfortable. So we get a, a positive feedback from getting out of something that was uncomfortable. That's important when we think about um, school and EBSA. Because what we have with that are what, what are called push and pull factors. And it's unpicking these push and pull factors that can help us 
start to think about the, the motivators and the reinforcers that keep behaviors or coping strategies in place. Now it's important to say, it isn't just push and pull in, in uh, one direction. You can see from this, uh, this diagram, it's both from and to home uh, and from and to school that we have push and pull. Okay. So for example, push from home, factors that may want somebody to leave home in order to go to school. So meeting friends is a good example of that. A pull to home, factors that may want, uh, make somebody want to stay at home. So for example, staying with a family member or um, spending time on the television. Push from school, factors that may um, want somebody to avoid school um, for example, feeling like teachers don't like you, feeling like there's a test that you're going to fail at, that's a push away from school. A pull to school, factors that make um, somebody want to attend, a favourite subject, a positive experience that you're going to have, that you know is going to happen. So we have this interaction between these different factors. So here are some other examples. And again, we're breaking this down into two areas here. These first ones are focused around the child or the young person. So a push factor away from school for a child might well be test anxiety, friendship difficulties, a noisy environment. But also there may be some parent or carer factors here. So if we as the adults are struggling to connect with school staff. If there's poor communications, if we don't feel that our young people's needs are being understood and supported, if that's communicated in a way that a young person uh, is aware of, that might be a factor that, that contributes to. Now it's important to say that that's not a blame point. It's awareness raising that our experiences and relationship with school impact on this situation as much as the young person's does. That means there's another aspect to solve. Not that it's set, but that there is a, a breakdown in that relationship that can be addressed. So if we look at those pull factors to school from the child, having a good transition, having connection with key adults, peer relationships, that whole sense of belonging, and we know uh, as psychologists, just how important a sense of belonging is. In fact, my own thesis uh, back in the day was written about the importance of uh, developing a sense of community and belonging in school and how that relates to um, long-term uh, outcomes in terms of school performance, but also in terms of uh, emotional health. The more you feel connected to your school, the lower your sense of loneliness, the higher your sense of life satisfaction. So these things really, really connect. And again, from a parent school, um, a parent carer and school perspective, if we trust that the other people that are in charge of looking after and educating our young people understand them, care for them, recognise and believe us and want to work with us, then that's a much more uh, positive relationship, isn't it? And, and that is... And enabling, it's a bit like, um, again, I mentioned attachment theory earlier, uh, but when you go to like um, young children and you think about them exploring new uh, social situations, you've got the, um, the kids that hide underneath, you know, underneath your skirts or are tied onto your legs like Velcro practically. But if they see that you're calm in a situation, they're more likely to explore a little bit further off. And they'll look back and see where you are and check that you're still there, but they'll engage a little bit more. The calmer that you are and the more comfortable you are, they, they feed off that too. Okay, so their zone of safety increases when we have a zone of safety. So our relationship with school matters just as much as young people's do. So that was thinking about the, um, uh, the pull factors um, um, from a, a school perspective and the push factors. But let's think about the home ones next. 
So factors that might influence a pull to home for, for children, they might feel safer at home. They might be worrying about what's going on at home when they're not there, about the people, about the things. They might prefer it because it's quiet and calm and the, the noise and, and stress levels of school are too overwhelming. It might be that it's the activities and the, the things that they have, and it could be the time. A realistic concern for us as parents recently has been COVID. And that's a fairly common one. I, I'll be honest, I was worried about my kids going in. Um, although I was a key worker, I kept my kids at, at home with myself and my wife for an extended period of time. You know, that was stressful enough. I'll, I'll hold my hands up, you know. We, I think we're all still recovering from, uh, from the, the pandemic. Um, it's, it's not gone and that, that impact will be there. But then let's think about other worries we might have. Kids going on school trips. That raises up my anxiety. My, my, my daughter is quite clumsy. The idea of her going to an outward bound trip fills me with dread. Um, will they cope? Will, will, if she struggles, will other people understand? I've had some interesting experiences um, with my, my kids' school about them not understanding her emotional struggles. Now, my daughter's now approaching secondary school and I'll hold my hands up and say, I, I don't know how that's gonna go. It could go brilliantly, but I worry about it. Um, I worry about her forming new relationships with staff and with peers and how, if that goes wrong, what, how they might judge or respond to things. So, you know, I, I worry about being away, but I have to own part of that and share elements of it with my daughter, but not so much that it impacts on her feelings. Easier said than done, I'll just say. And then the push factors from home. So um, the fact that we're not here, okay? You have to go to school because there is nobody here. Um, your friends are there and they're not here. So you get that, that push there, that, 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 that desire to see them and the activities um, that you might be able to get engaged with. So for example, um, the, the favoured activities, whether that's within school or just outside of the house, we get into that real anxiety of not being able to leave the house at all, irrespective of school, then we're looking at those other things too. And then with the parent, um, side of things too. So we have all of these um, various different factors and they're not exclusive. They're examples. So I'm trying to highlight that there are things going on um, both on the pull and the push side, both from the home and from the school side and from the young person and their extended network. And we are the immediate part of their extended network. So after today, if you're ever experiencing EBSA type issues, take a moment to think through these elements. What factors are the pushes from home, the pulls to home, the pushes to school, the pulls to school? If you can start identifying some of those and the young person as a voice in that and school staff as a voice in that, then that's the start of a plan where we're identifying challenges or, 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 or areas that we can make adjustments about. So let's think together now about what kind of things we can do from a, from a home perspective about supporting a young person who's experiencing this level of anxiety towards school. This cycle um, was developed originally by West Sussex local authority based on all the information that we've been uh, talking through to kind of demonstrate how school non-attendance can uh, become in this spiral. So it might start from any of these points, but they build into each other. So that, that negative thinking, the feeling anxiety about school, feeling overwhelmed and unable to cope, looking for a way of avoiding that feeling because it's causing you stress, doing that and then 
feeling less worried. So you increase doing that. And then when you're challenged to do it more, to, do, to go back in, it gets into that same cycle. Okay, so we have these, uh, um, these factors going on that, that we need to recognize happen on a um, kind of secular basis. Even if we, uh, if, if we notice any of these, we can um, start to step into the spaces between them. But we've got to notice that it's a constant cycle that, that we need to be uh, supporting. So here are a few things we can try. Um, I'm going to call these the six C's. The first is thinking about how we promote this change. The first is about those curious questions that we were talking about. Engage with your young person um, about their worries on school. There's an approach called PACE that we talk about often um, when, when we're talking about how to talk to young people. And PACE stands for playful, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. Playful, not everything has to be a serious discussion. Acceptance, whatever a young person is feeling or thinking, their starting point is valid. That's how they're feeling. Curious, we might think we understand why, but we don't know what's going on for that young person in their heads. We need to help understand from their perspective. That's where the, the curious questions come in. The curiosity helps open up them to explaining how they're feeling, but also helps them explore how they're feeling. Empathy, being able to empathize and understand and, and, and uh, kind of relate to somebody on an emotional level helps that safety feel uh, stronger, help somebody feel heard and listened to. And it's in that relationship building element that then helps any challenge or change come. So talk with your child to explore their worries about school. If you're struggling with that, there are others that can help. So the EP service do a whole package around EBSA. And some approaches we might use, there are questionnaires for, for uh, parents and for young people and for staff. There are other approaches. There's something called uh, a landscape of fear, um, which sounds very daunting, but is pretty much you look at your school environment and, and are rating how stressful or calm you find different environments or different activities. It was developed by a woman called Kate Ripley, who was a specialist DP for autism in Hampshire, now retired. Um, really good um, resource that to be able to utilise even if you're using it in a kind of color coding, rag rating, red, amber, green for different areas of the school. I know that one school in Southampton, Shirley Warren used that a few years ago to discover that a lot of people found the toilet area uh, in their setting really scary. And they adjusted that by painting it and by making um, uh, music playing it. So there are things that we can do to adjust this at an environmental level, not just a child specific level. Can I just say we have um, information about that on our file section on the Facebook group. So if people can find it, they can there. Thanks, Jill. That's really, really good. Um, so be curious about uh, why they might be worried. Be curious about how they're feeling and how they're experiencing that. Help to name the emotion. There's an approach called emotion coaching that it is uh, the, the idea you meet somebody in the emotion that they're in validate it and help them understand it. Now that, again, easier said than done, a lot of this stuff, but it's about trying to engage with that. Acknowledging that the, their worries are real, that that feeling is genuine. Um, help them to be a thought detective about why might they be feeling this way? Why might they be responding in this way? Give them other outlets, whether it's writing it down, whether it's texting it, whether it's drawing it. Um, when working with anxiety, I quite often um, spend time making a worry monster with a young person and then introduce that as a way of sharing it, getting it out of yourself. My daughter journals, doesn't always journal particularly successfully, but it's that she loves writing. So that's her medium for, for working things through. So that's are curious, engage in the questioning, be present with that. K 
caring. This is about helping know they're not alone. Think about how we can encourage them and co-regulate with them and acknowledge the struggle in their experience. How do we let them know that we're still thinking of them when we're not with them? How do we show that we're holding them in mind? And how do we give them that link to us? I often talk about this for, for young people who have experienced bereavement too, or, or worried about transitions. So um, if they're worried that you're not gonna be there, how do I know you're gonna be coming back? Well, hang on, I'm gonna give you something of mine to look after. Here's my pen. Can you use my special pen today? And by, by the way, a special pen should not be a special pen, it just needs to be a cheap pen. You don't wanna lose the special pen. Um, can you use my, uh, can you keep my uh, hat in your bag for safekeeping today? You know, something small that's not going to disrupt lesson, but is going to show that you're uh, still connected to that person, uh, uh, an object of reference, if you will. Um, or uh, that, that kind of thinking forwards conversation. I'm really looking forward to picking you up after school when we're going to do this. You know, so you're, you're saying, I'm coming back, we're going to be here when we've succeeded which I know we're going to do we're going to do this um, part of the caring is that being active listener being present hearing not just listening so feeling that that through uh, empathizing and encouraging that person to share it's important here though to also think about what questions not to ask you don't want to um, ask questions that prompt somebody to become more anxious. How are you feeling about the school trip that's coming up? That might cause more anxiety than it solves. Um, you could ask if they're worrying about it or ask, what are you looking forward to? So you can kind of shape the type of conversation that you're, you're starting, that mindfulness about how they might be feeling. In this, it's important to try and stay calm yourself. If you're anxious about things, like we talked about before, it's easy to transfer that anxiety onto others. But what we're doing, and what we need to do is, is model some of those recognition and management strategies. So, do you know what? I'm a little bit uh, nervous about you going, and I know that's okay. I know that's my anxiety. I'm gonna own that. And what I'm doing to manage that is, or when I'm a bit nervous, what I find that helps is, shall we try some of that together? Those type of um, collaboration type uh, behaviours can be really, really helpful. And here is also where we need to make sure we're linking with school. Because if we're doing something in isolation at home, even if it's a collaboration between us and our young person, if school aren't aware of that, or aren't reinforcing and, and adjusting their approach uh, to uh, kind of collaborate with us and incorporate that, then we are likely to be coming up against a barrier rather than a, a solution. So if we communicate effectively with school, we can come up with a, a positive plan together. And then we can reassure a young person that school is on our team. There's an important uh, acronym there, team. Team, for me, stands for together, everyone achieves more. And the more people we can have on a, on a team or the more uh, uh, key people we can have on a team, the better the, the outcome. Um, here as well, boundaries help. So when we're thinking about uh, levels of control, uh, we need to let, the, let young people know that school's not optional. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's part of our... Um, element that we need to do. Um, it's like our work as young people. We have to, and this, there are consequences for young people who don't attend school. So there needs to be a, a, a clear boundary, but with that comes the, the, the caring empathy of, and this is how we're going to work to make this a better experience. It shouldn't be ever that we're forcing somebody to go into a situation that is causing them emotional and physical pain, it's then how do we solve that? So other um, positive boundaries that we can put in place. Things that help promote a um, positive expectation. So for example, we talked about some of those avoidance behaviors such as um, not having your 
school uniform ready or losing your shoes? Well, if we get the organisation right the night before, maybe that's a, a job that we as parents take on or carers take on so that it takes it out of the young person's um, responsibility. Or maybe it's something we build up to, right? Okay, just get your shoes for me, pop them at the end of your bed. Okay, or, you know, one thing at a time, a small step. So that when those routines are established, the young person gets less overwhelmed by everything all, as, all at once and more uh, kind of built up and ready to do. Our fifth C is coping. And this is the idea that normalizing that anxiety response is important and having a toolbox of coping strategies is important. Uh, one thing I struggled with um, during lockdown is my go-to stress relief is exercise um, and where we weren't allowed out uh, as much and recently I've had a back injury that's meant that I haven't been able to exercise. So um, I found my, my go-to coping strategy isn't available. What do I replace it with? Most of the time crisps, which isn't a good uh, replacement, I can tell you. Um, it feels like a good replacement at the time, but Long term, not so good. So the more tools that we have in our, our toolbox to cope when we feel uncomfortable rather than solely avoid. Yes, we want to, to adjust that situation so it's less stressful, but we're all going to be in stressful situations or anxious, anxiety-provoking situations that we need to cope with. So having the skills to, to, to manage those that we can uh, work on with our young people, whether it's having a, a worry monster, like we said, or whether it's a, a sensory soothing box or whether it's practicing mindfulness or whether it's um, relax kids, some of those CDs that, that can help us with those or um, various different things, working on those and practicing with young people when they're calm, that's a, a, the best place for us to learn those. And then finally, coaching meeting the young person where they are with their emotions and helping them um, to recognize those and, and work through them. Now, that's not something that we can just suddenly do. We've got to build up to it. So it's uh, take it one step at a time, um, be, be realistic that anxiety is part of everyday life, uh, but it is something we can manage. That, that idea, I, I referenced Russ Harris earlier in acceptance and commitment therapy, it's, it's the idea that we, we can't get rid of our feelings. They are true, they are real, but they don't stay with us forever. They are visiting and that they do pass and that there are things that we can do to help acknowledge them rather than try and block them out and help move them along. Okay, so, so strategies and, and, and coaching along those lines um, can be really helpful. So from our point of view, even one small change in any of these C's could be a helpful start for a young person experiencing uh, emotionally based school uh, absence. And then if we get other people on our team that are also doing one thing and we've got the young person doing one thing, well, suddenly we're doing at least three things. Okay, and we build that up small steps by small steps. And that's one of the principles with emotion, uh, emotional based school absence. It's not a quick fix. It's not a once and done. It's a, we're working on this and we're working on it long term because those spirals can reoccur very easily. And it's um, our job to then um, notice that when it's happening and help build up the capacity to cope with those times of challenge. Okay. So, Keep with those, uh, those C's, some extra C's there for you as well. The idea that we're holding the young person in mind at the center of what we're doing. Um, the idea that we're being compassionate, that yes, safe levels of challenge can bring around positive change. But a complete recognition that this is not simple and straightforward. It's hard work and it is a long-term process. Okay. So if we were to stop here, I'd be saying to you, um, it's time now to, to, to think, think about all of that from an EDSA point of view in your, in your own situation. So that's kind of my take home message. 
around EBSA. The, 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 there's the push and the pull factors, there's the anxiety underneath it, there are the small changes we can make. The next section I have are those two yellow parts. And uh, if I continue now, I will go on for another uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. So rather than do that, what I'm gonna su suggest to Jill is that I record something for you guys uh, just as an add-on um, to, to, to share on your YouTube channel around those two, two areas, looking after yourselves and then the notion of resilience. Um, and open up the floor instead, come out of screen sharing, come out of questions, um, uh, sorry, come into questions. Uh, Jill, would you want to record those questions? No, or... I'm, I'll stop recording now if you're all done on that bit. Thank you ever so much.